Welcome to the strange and scary mysteries of the month, where we find the craziest stories from all around the world and lay it all out for you here. I'm Andrew. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoy the strange and scary mysteries of the month for September 2023. Number five, the mystery lights above Morocco. Recently, social media lit up with some perplexing videos from Morocco. These weren't your usual viral clips, but something much more eerie and unsettling. Above the skyline, brilliant flashes illuminated the vast expanse, leaving locals and viewers around the world stunned. Just moments later, a devastating earthquake would shake the country that left thousands dead. Such a spectacle might have been dismissed as mere coincidence or digital fabrication had it not been for the historical precedence of such bizarre occurrences. Earlier in the year, similar inexplicable lights graced the skies during severe tremors in Turkey and Syria. Rewind a few more years, and you'll find similar tales from Mexico following a seven-magnitude quake in 2017. And these types of sightings go back even further. 1975 in China, before a 7.3 quake, they saw aurora-like lights. In 1906 in San Francisco, the same thing. Even in ancient times, they described immense columns of flame being seen before city-destroying earthquakes. So, if the lights are in fact seen, what exactly are they? These flashes for many are manifestations of a phenomenon known as earthquake lights, or EQL. Throughout history, tales have been recounted of sheet lightning, luminous balls, and steady glows accompanying seismic events. However, not every shimmering light amidst a tremor gets the nod from geologists. With the unpredictable nature of earthquakes, studying the EQL phenomenon in real time has been challenging, to say the least. Dr. Yataka Yasu, a Japanese geologist was among the first to offer tangible evidence of such occurrences. His photographs from the mid-1960s showcased eerie reddish and blue clouds in the sky above Matsushiro during a series of significant tremors. But for every believer, there is of course a skeptic. A significant number of people in the scientific community as well as the general public question whether these luminous displays even have a genuine association with seismic events. In Boston College's seismologist John Ebel noted, which ones are real and which ones are simply products of the imagination? We're still trying to determine. However, geophysicist Friedman Frund has a theory. As he explained, the lights could be a direct result of the movement in the earthquake's plate tectonics. Certain stressed rocks under the influence of seismic waves can indeed release a charge. When these charges near the surface, they can combine and lead to electrical discharges manifesting as these mysterious lights. Despite the profound mysteries surrounding EQL, there's a consensus on their rarity. Research suggests that these lights appear in less than 0.5 of global earthquakes, with sightings mostly concentrated in parts of Europe, South America, and Asia. For now, as the Earth keeps shifting and moving, the scientific world remains divided on EQL's legitimacy, whether it's the planet's way of signaling an impending seismic event or just a play of the imagination. Only time and more research will tell. Number four. The Accidental Confession On a summer evening in Brazil, Indiana, the chilling sounds of brutality got recorded for the world to hear. The contents of this voicemail would not only shake a community, but would serve as irrefutable evidence in one of the most shocking murder trials in all of Clay County's history. Cody Wade, a 33-year-old resident, seemed to have a track record for trouble. Only recently released from jail due to an arson conviction in Vigo County in 2018, Wade was already on the community's radar. But what transpired on June 18th of 2020 was beyond what anyone imagined. After leaving a local barbecue, Wade made his way to his mother's home. En route, he took a detour, stopping at a friend's house where, with a chilling calmness to him, 
Wade confided that he was on the verge of committing a violent act. It was as if he was giving himself a pump-up speech before a big game. And when he was packed full of adrenaline, he drove over to his mother's home. He opened the door in a fit of uncontrolled rage and under the watchful eyes of his horrified mother, Wade mercilessly attacked Carl Haviland, his mother's boyfriend. The scene was grisly. Not only did Wade's mother witness it, but she tried in vain to stop her son to save the life of the man she loved. The traumatic scene reached its climax as Wade, after stabbing Haviland, cruelly kicked and mocked the dying man. But what Wade didn't realize was that in the lead up to the murder, he had inadvertently dialed his mother's phone, which meant he left a voicemail that recorded the entire incident. This voicemail would later reverberate through the courtroom as prosecutors played the evidence to a jury that sat in shocked silence. In the case, led by Clay County Chief Deputy Prosecutor Zach Clapp, unveiled a timeline of events that painted Wade as not just a perpetrator of a heinous crime, but as a man battling his own demons. Diagnosed with bipolar disorder, Wade's mental health was part of the broader conversation during the trial. When given a chance to address the court recently, Wade's voice broke the heavy silence. Three years had passed since that night, and he spoke of genuine remorse for the loss of a friend and the weight of his actions. Judge Robert Pell, in delivering the sentencing, was poignant in his words, highlighting the tragic event that took place in front of the defendant's own mother. Wade received a total of 85 years in jail, a combination of charges that reflected not only the murder, but his prior violent interactions with law enforcement and his status as a habitual offender. Beyond the headlines and court documents, at the heart of this tragic event was Carl Havland, a graduate of North Central High School, a patriot who served his country during Desert Storm and later with the National Guard. He was more than just a name and a case file. He was a good man who didn't deserve what happened to him. Number three, the dark shadows of Pennsylvania's past. In the heart of Pennsylvania, the echoes of dark histories reverberate as another fugitive has slipped through the fingers of law enforcement. This isn't the first time the residents of Chester County have locked their doors in trepidation. The tales of Norman Johnston and recently Danello Cavalcante parallel with eerie similarity, casting a shadow over a region that until recently personified the quintessential American small town. Danello's escape from the Chester County prison on August 31st startled the nation. The 34-year-old convicted of murder managed to conquer a razor-wired wall by pushing against a narrow enclosure with his hands and feet. His chameleon-like ability to change appearance combined with stolen vehicles and assistance from family and friends made him an elusive criminal roaming the streets and woods. The continuous ping of ring doorbell cameras have captured fleeting images of Cavalcante, but like a ghost, he remains just out of reach. The current atmosphere in Pennsylvania arcs back to August of 1999. Norman Johnson of the infamous Johnson brothers, who were part of a burglary ring and ultimately charged with killing six men, was facing life in jail and Norman eventually masterminded a cinematic style escape. Using paper bags and real hair, he fabricated a life-size dummy as a decoy. With the use of simple tools, he sawed through bars, squeezing himself to liberty. Johnston's escape felt like a storyline straight out of a thriller film. In a way, it was. And their sinister saga was dramatized in the film At Close Range, which featured stars like Christopher Walken and Sean Penn. But once out, Norman navigated a transformed Chester County, a place that had evolved from rolling farmlands when he went into jail to bustling suburbs. Rumors swirled of buried treasures and cash hidden like pirate loot in the now developed terrains, but Johnston's motives went beyond buried gold. He sought papers, and papers he believed held his ticket to innocence. Both men, Johnston and Cavalcante, understood the art of blending in. 
They shifted appearances by shaving and changing hairstyles, leaned on kin for refuge and borrowed cars to evade capture. The game of cat and mouse played out in real time with authorities always one step behind. The run Norman run became a cultural catchphrase of the time, a reflection of the public's morbid fascination with the entire chase. However, technology, or rather the lack of understanding it, became Johnston's undoing. After almost 20 years in prison, modern electric gas pumps bewildered him, leading to a desperate crash. When finally cornered, exhaustion weighed him down, signaling an end to an epic manhunt. He'd been on the run for 19 days through Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And today, as the shadows of Cavalcante looms large, residents can't help but draw comparisons. The escape has resurfaced old memories, feelings of vulnerability, and fears. Every corner discussion, every local diner chat, centers around one topic. Danello Cavalcante. With surveillance cameras dotting homes and businesses, one would think capturing him would be straightforward. It wasn't, but he was finally brought down on September 13th. Number two, unsolved mystery of Robin Lawrence. In the early winter days of November of 1994, the suburbs of Springfield, Virginia were rattled by a gruesome discovery. Robin Lawrence, 37-year-old mother was found brutally stabbed to death in her own home. The only witness to this horrifying act was her two-year-old daughter. Unharmed but scarred by memories, she was too young to even comprehend. Detective Mark Garman, in his pursuit of truth and justice, combed the crime scene meticulously and happened upon a pivotal piece of forensic evidence. This evidence harboring DNA from the culprit was meticulously preserved, standing the test of time. It would later become the cornerstone in solving a mystery that had gone cold for almost three decades. However, in the initial days following the murder, hope dimmed when the DNA sample did not match any known profiles in police databases. The case gradually faded from the spotlight and then became an unsolved mystery. Fast forward to 2019, advancements in DNA technology gave new life to the investigation. A sample that Detective Garman had collected was sent to a DNA testing company in Virginia. Armed with cutting edge technology, they developed a genetic profile and initiated a search through genealogical databases. Navigating this intricate web of ancestry, detectives painstakingly pieced together clues. And over the course of three long years, their efforts converged on one individual, Stephen Smirk, a 51-year-old resident of Niskayuna, New York. Yet identifying a suspect was only half the battle. In a fascinating blend of science and art, the DNA technology company, Parabon Nanolabs, used digital composite sketches to create Smirk's appearance at the time of the crime. This futuristic portrayal was juxtaposed with photographs of a younger smirk, strengthening the detectives' belief in their prime suspect. When detectives made the journey to New York to talk with smirk, their confrontation with him would take a turn no one expected. After a brief interaction and leaving behind a business card, a startling phone call from smirk cracked the case wide open. Being overwhelmed by the weight of his dark past, he called and confessed in vivid detail about the fateful night he robbed and murdered Lawrence. Despite the details of his confession, what was most bewildering was the absence of a motive. There was no discernible connection between Smirk and Lawrence, no prior history, and most eerily, no apparent reason for the crime. To add to the enigma, Smirk had no criminal history and had never been in the police crosshairs before. Number one, Crystal Rogers' disappearance. In the town of Bardstown, Kentucky, there's a mystery that has baffled residents and law enforcement alike for over eight years. Recent developments have brought hope that justice might finally be served. 
Crystal Rogers, a loving mother of five, vanished without a trace on July 3rd of 2015. This young mother's sudden disappearance left a gaping hole in the hearts of those who knew and loved her, igniting a search that would stretch on for years. And the story would go on to take a sinister turn two days later when her vehicle was found abandoned on the side of a highway. Inside, the signs of her sudden departure lay evident. Her keys, purse, and most chillingly, her cell phone were all found within the car, as though she'd been pulled away mid-activity. For the investigators, this was no mere case of someone deciding to start life anew. Foul play was suspected, and the search for Crystal intensified. Brooks Houck, her boyfriend, claimed he was the last person to see her, but as the days turned into months and months to years, no significant leads or suspects emerged. Brooks was the prime suspect at first, but there was no evidence sticking to him. Eventually, the case grew cold, the hope of finding her began to wane. That is, until a recent bombshell shook the case to its core. Court documents recently revealed the arrest of 32-year-old Joseph Lawson. He is facing charges of criminal conspiracy to commit murder and tampering with physical evidence. While Rogers' name doesn't directly appear in the records, connections have been made. And both a family member and Lawson's lawyer have confirmed the arrest links back to the Rogers case. How exactly, we're not being told yet. Did Lawson know Crystal? What role, if any, did he play in her disappearance? And if he was involved, why? Was this a crime of passion or something even more sinister? Lawson appeared in court maintaining his innocence and pleading not guilty. With a bond set at half a mil, the town, and most importantly, Crystal's family, awaits his next appearance, slated for October 26th. Promises to be a pivotal moment in a case that has both haunted and perplexed a community for almost a decade. As we wait for the details, one thing's for certain. The hope of closure and justice for Crystal Rogers and her loved ones is once again alive. With each unfolding chapter, the truth slowly inches closer to the light and Bardstown holds its breath for answers. So there were the strange and scary mysteries of the month for September 2023. I'm Andrew and we have lots of other content for you all around the place. Check out the links in the description to find the ones you like best. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'll see you soon.